Welcome to Box Office bob Bombs. If a movie is based on a video game, chances are it's going to blow. Across the aisle from me is a man who, by court order, is prohibited from coming within 500 feet of a Poke Center, Pokemon Gym, or any other location at which Pokemon are regularly traded or battled, Mr. Dylan Flynn. And across the aisle from me, a man who went walking through the tall grass in search of a Pokemon, but all he managed to catch was Lyme disease, Mr. Trevor Itgrad. <sighs> we love you! Those are just the kind of cheers you imagine people would be making as I walk into like a big stadium to engage in a Pokemon battle, right? I'd like to introduce a man to you, not really to you, you already know him, Trevor, but to you, the listener, a man who is a screenwriter, a filmmaker, and just a lover of cinema in general. He's a friend of yours and mine, Trevor. Welcome to the show, Ben Pitt. Hey, guys. Happy to be here. Welcome, Ben. Happy to have you here as our, you know, honorary player three. Okay, you're a fire type, Trevor. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to give Ben a grass type and myself a water type. Yeah, I think that tracks. Ben's kind of got like a user-friendly atmosphere about him, I think. And Dylan, you're just so fluid. You know, you just go with the flow. I got a, a sort of a roundish, wet quality. That's gross. <laughs> Speaking of gross, let's talk about things that make money. Today, we're here to talk about a film from 1999 called Pokemon, the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back. This Sunday night, you are going to be in Poke Heaven. Pokemon, the first movie. Prepare to enter Poke Heaven. The Pokemon music video sneak peek during 7th Heaven Beginnings this Sunday night on the WB. That's right. And if somehow you've never uh, become familiar with the Pokemon franchise, you might want to change that if you're going, if you're planning on following this show, because I believe we have quite a few of these things coming at us in the near future this being the first one who's to say yeah we don't know i don't know i think this is the first movie that we're doing that i actually remember having knowledge of and going to see as a kid so that's kind of exciting yeah i definitely remember the theatrical run it feels like pokemon was the first big thing that dropped when i was a kid that didn't really have like a pre-existing kind of fan base already. Like, I'd gotten into Mario, you know, I was playing the Zelda games and stuff, but all of that was kind of like just before my time, you know, mm -hmm. like... Obviously, Star Wars on VHS, that goes way back. Yeah. I also feel like it's a big cultural divide. Like, you are either a Pokemon kid or you did not understand Pokemon at all. Sure, or maybe you were a parent who was concerned about Pokemon. Mm -hmm. That was another person you could be. Let's talk about some of the stats of this movie we're here to discuss. This film was released by Warner Brothers on November 10th, 1999. It is based on the role-playing games Pokemon Red and Blue, published by Nintendo for the Game Boy in 1998. It's a little different than the other video game adaptations that we've talked about, though, because this one isn't really just like a clean cut, hey, here's a video game, let's turn it into a movie. This is That's right. kind of a a big event release accompanying what was at the time also a like weekly anime series for children. I mean, this was a thing that you could not escape. For me, I believe I was in fourth grade when they started dropping these and I was like, I would rush home from school to watch uh, season one of the Pokemon anime series. That's weird. I remember it being a morning watch for me. I was like in second or third grade. I would like wake up in the morning. I would watch an episode of Pokemon. Pokemon was a Saturday morning cartoon in my memory. Well, as you can tell by my speech, I'm Australian. So oh, when yeah. I was getting off school, you guys were just waking up. You're recording this episode upside down in reverse. I'm going to go flush the toilet, watch it spin around counterclockwise. So uh, fair to say we all have a pretty firm background with Pokemon. That's right. The movie we're here to discuss today, though, uh, cost $5 million to produce and <laughs> earned $172.7 million internationally. That's the cheapest theatrical wide release video game movie ever made, Trevor. Uh, and also the highest grossing one that we've talked about so far, at least. As a matter of fact, as of this recording, it is still the highest grossing Japanese anime movie in United States history. Those are the kind of numbers you imagine you love to see as a film exec. Spend five, get 172. I mean, yeah, they're my fucking dick's hard already. <laughs> we got to add $5 to that, too, because I did, in fact, pay to rent this yesterday. Three ninety nine for standard definition. <laughs> this was also the widest release for a video game movie we've seen so far. This is up from Mortal Kombat's 2,421 screens to 2,901 screens. I mean, Pokemon Fever. We remember yeah. what it was like. Stranglehold. 
obviously it was gripping the nation. If you're a distributor, you're you're booking this in five screens at every multiplex. I have actually physical evidence that I saw this in theaters multiple times because I did go check. But I do still have on hand two of the special exclusive Pokemon trading cards that you received when you would go buy a ticket. Very cool. I got the exclusive Mewtwo that has like, you know, the hollow foil graphic on it. Yeah. Awesome. And I got the little like Dragonite with a messenger bag that they put out. My favorite character in the movie, I'll say right now. Oh, damn. Yeah. Dragonite with his man purse. Yeah. Very cool. I did unfortunately miss this one in theaters as it turns out. How old were you in 99? I was eight. But unfortunately, we were actually living abroad at the time. We were living in the Netherlands for a few years when I was a kid. But I had the VHS copy of Pokemon The Adventure Begins, the first couple episodes of the show. And it had a trailer for Pokemon, the first movie, at the start of the tape. And I can just remember watching just that trailer and my brother and I just getting so hyped to be like, oh my god, we have to see this. Apparently the Dutch were not super into Pokemon, or at least not into letting you go see it in their movie theaters. I've heard, unfortunately, that the literal translation of Gotta Catch Em All into Dutch is extremely vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> Director Kunihiko Uyama, uh, who directed this film, was an anime veteran with a career spanning all the way back to the late 70s and still working today. Uh, he was also just the general director of the Pokemon television series, so... Pretty one-to-one in terms of the crew of that show versus this movie. This one had a lot of kind of meddling as it made its way out of Japan, though. Um, The English language screenplay was revised and localized by producer Norman J. Grossfield, who was a television renaissance man, uh, whose many achievements include directing NBC's coverage of three separate Olympic Games. Uh, He composed Gotta Go Fast, the theme song to Sonic X. And he even coined that slogan I just mentioned, Gotta Catch Them All for the Pokemon franchise. Man, what a a legacy. Yeah, legend for sure. You're listening to this, you have a basic idea, right? There's pocket monsters, they're fighting each other. But perhaps we can zoom in just a little bit closer, Trevor, as you take us through the plot of Pokemon, the first movie Mewtwo Strikes Back. A group of aspiring Pokemon masters are invited to New Island for a chance to battle the world's greatest Pokemon trainer. Or so they think. In truth, they've fallen into the clutches of Mewtwo, a super intelligent Pokemon who's building an army of clones on his quest for world domination. Damn. Speaking of Mewtwo and Doug Trio and Kabutops, let's get into this wonderful, colorful cast of characters. That's crazy. You just named my top three Pokemon. But yeah, let's do it. <laughs> the We've three got the most famous. I, I have a bit of an issue with the way you've arranged our castles here because I feel like you've put the lead of this movie second. Oh boy. So I'm going to start with him. We've got the main character of this movie, Mewtwo. A lab-generated psychic Pokemon whose bitter resentment towards humanity is matched only by his fearsome power. He's played by Jay Geode, uh, who is credited under the pseudonym Philip Bartlett. Because his name sounded too much like Geodude? That's what I was thinking. I guess you're right in as much as the protagonist of a film, or at least the focal character of a film, is the character with an arc. The prota- like the protagonist, the good guy in the movie, Ash Ketchum and his friends, doesn't even show up until like 25 minutes into the film. That's true, or at least into the screening. Speaking of Ash, let's talk about him. Ash Ketchum, a young trainer who has a special bond with his team of Pokemon, Played by Veronica Taylor. Who can forget that little voice? Yeah, Ash. I remember even as a kid, I was not a big Ash Ketchum guy. I thought he was annoying even back then. And as somebody who was into the Pokemon games, I didn't think he was a good Pokemon trainer. Let's battle! Yeah, I do distinctly remember thinking that I was definitely a better Pokemon trainer than Ash. I also had a particular uh, beef with him in that I've always been a a huge Raichu stan. And uh, I can remember the episode where he's like fighting Lieutenant Surge and someone's like, oh, do you want to just evolve your Pikachu? And I was like, yes, 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 yes. And then he's like, no. And I was like, you bitch. Okay, but imagine, Ben, what kind of brand suicide that would have (laughs) been. I mean, yeah, I get that now that I'm an adult. (laughs) Now that I'm a 30-year-old man, a lot of the themes surrounding Ash and his Pokemon is just like 
accepting your state of arrested development of just like, no, 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 it's okay. We'll leave my, we'll leave them as starters so they don't get, you know, because that's the way I know them and that's the way I'm most comfortable. And you know what? As millennials, I feel like we can really uh, connect with that because uh, we're a whole generation of starter Pokemon who never evolved. <laughs> yeah, this this whole franchise does feel very prescient in that way. Uh, let's talk about the little yellow critter upon which billions and billions Billions of dollars have been made. Pikachu, Ash's best friend, a cute and courageous electric Pokemon played by Ikue Otani. Always so interesting to think about how he has become, you know, or has been from the very beginning, the mascot of the entire Pokemon franchise. When even in the early games, Pikachu played an extremely minor role and you could easily go through one of those things without like even seeing him or catching him, let alone. We talked about it on the first episode that Mario is like one of our main video game guys. I think this is the second time in the show where we've hit a top five video game guy. I think Pikachu is inalienable video game iconography. For sure. Yeah. I mean, by this point, there's no question about it. He's up there with Mario and Sonic. Uh, okay. Those are the big three. Let's keep going. We got Misty, Ash's travel companion who trains water type Pokemon, played by Rakal Lillis. Right. And we've got Brock, Ash's other travel companion who cares more about preparing food and chasing skirts than training Pokemon, played by Eric Stewart. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In a, in a very, in my opinion, clever uh, move of double cast. Sting. We just talked about them. Yeah. Uh, Misty's voice actress, Raquel Lillis, also plays Jesse, the magenta haired uh, Team Rocket member who's, uh, you know, meddlesome but kind of inept and they're organized criminals, those guys. Uh -huh. and, and Brock's voice actor, Eric Stewart, also plays James, Jesse's blue haired partner in crime, uh, who has a knack for finishing her sandwiches. Great. I had no idea about this instance of double casting until i read these notes um i think that's pretty cool there's something very weirdly like the word i keep going back to is like psychosexual but i don't think it's psychosexual it's <laughs> psycho something though it is it is vaguely kantian isn't it though it's an interesting statement on how sometimes your closest friends are also your worst enemies rica lillis in particular i think that's that's impressive vocal range because i feel like the jesse voice and the misty voice are so far apart in the way that they are coded for their age in their attitude all that stuff yeah i will say that i had no idea this is news to me but i'm, I'm fascinated by it brock and jay Games are not exactly close either. There's a third member of Team Rocket who we've also got to talk about, though. Maybe my favorite guy, uh, Meowth, Jesse and James's minion, who is a little greedy cat Pokemon who speaks English with a Brooklyn accent, and he's played by uh, Madeline Blaustein. Meowth fills the official comic relief role, wouldn't you say? If puns count as jokes, then he is for sure the biggest joke maker. Uh, let's get down to the real D-listers here. We got Nurse Joy, a Pokemon Center employee who becomes Mewtwo's thrall, played by Megan Hollingshead. Yep, and we've also got Officer Jenny, who you in the notes have described as a fascist pig, <laughs> played by Lee Quick. Uh, Miranda, the harbor master of the old wharf in this film, played by Lisa Ortiz, could not quite put my finger on what accent she was going for. It sounded a little Russian. It sounded a little French. We've also got three other minor Pokemon trainers to talk about. We've got Fergus, Corey, and Nisha, just three other trainers who traveled to New Island for the the tournament or to meet Mewtwo, rather. Yeah, gun to my head, I could not have named those characters. Although I think I could yeah. come up with their nicknames for all their starters. Whoa! Can you? The Venusaur's name was Brew Brew, which was cool. super bad. Oh, boy, yeah. And then... Oh, it was like Shell Shocker. Shell Shocker was the Blastoise. And then Ash is like, he may not have a nickname, but here's Charizard. And I'm like, name your Pokemon, you fuck. <laughs> it was, I did think it was a nice touch to have like two or three other guys along for the ride who could provide us with the other like fully evolved starter Pokemon. Mm, yeah. And it's nice to have lots and lots of guys and gals to weigh in on the uh, critical value of the film. So let's look at the critical reception. On Rotten Tomatoes, this movie has a 16% critic score and a 72% user score. Definitely the highest user score so far. I believe Mortal Kombat 95 had a 57% and definitely the widest gap between critic and common man we've seen on the show. Yeah, these, these numbers don't surprise me at all, though, because this seems like a movie, like knowing what I know about the Pokemon fan base, I feel like it doesn't do a lot that's going to be like wrong by them. 
But also, like, if you're not in the Pokemon fan base, I feel like there's a pretty high wall of entry when it comes to Pokemon. Many of the critics use the phrase critic proof, which I think, uh, mm. you know, speaks to that dynamic you're talking about, Trevor. We've got some reviews here, as always. I'll read this one from Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times. He says, there is no level at which it enriches a young viewer by encouraging thinking or observation. But I may have completely bypassed the point and misinterpreted crucial Pokemon lore. This may disqualify me from ever becoming a Pokemon trainer. I like to think he'd still have a shot. We also got a uh, quote here from a Rotten Tomatoes user, Jackie M. They say, I only signed up to make this review. The critics are biased and have no idea what they're talking about. Pokemon is a lifestyle. Lifestyle on all caps. Wow. So, Dylan, you've dug up some pretty interesting trivia on this movie. We mentioned her before. Uh, the voice actress who plays Meowth, uh, Madeline Blaustein, had a particularly interesting life and career that I'd like to chat with you guys about briefly. Sounds like she juggled many professional pursuits in addition to voice acting. She did. She wrote for Marvel Comics in the 1980s. She was actually in charge of Spider-Man for a brief time of its run. Wow. Then in the 90s, she was the creative director of the grocery store tabloid magazine, uh, the Weekly World News, where Bat Boy comes from. Yeah, home of Bat Boy. She was also a 3D modeler and video game developer and worked on Second Life. That's, I mean, you know, oh, quite cool. a CV she put up there yeah we, weird venn diagram of like industries and niches she she's been in that's very cool a trailblazer in other ways too madeline blastein was uh born intersex assigned male at birth but came out as a trans woman in the 1990s and was a uh trans right and socialism activist and organizer voices in anime trans rights activists open socialist i mean did she travel back from our era to the 1990s what a what a ahead of the curve this madeline was yeah absolutely there are i feel like there is a lot of potential crossover for a lot of those things you know like you know trailblazing trans person in the 90s of course they're doing voice acting in anime unfortunately in 2008 she sadly passed away at the young age of 48 from an untreated stomach disease boy she never really got to lived to see the world become a place that was full of Madeline Blaustein. But at least she did live to see a world that was full of Pokemon. That's true. <laughs> what a gift. Yeah. <laughs> what a gift that was for her. <laughs> but let's let's move on and talk about some of the uh, significant thematic changes that happened when this movie was localized for the West. And I think that this is a good point to ask you guys. Did you guys watch the original Japanese cut of this movie? Or did you watch the 20-minute um, shorter international version? Oh, international baby came in with that nice, tight 70 minutes, not watching any of that supplemental shit. Okay, Ben, what about you? I watched the uh, English dub that I grew up with, 75 minutes. Damn, I watched the Japanese cut of this movie, and I guess I'm going to be the one who has to talk about how different it is and like all the extra material in it cool i'm glad someone on this episode did that it's almost like ben and i watched red version and you watched green version whoa Ooh. yeah you're you're really pulling out the original japanese lore there <laughs> but let's talk about some of the some of the differences in the original japanese version of this movie there is an entire like 20 minutes at the beginning of the film that kind of starts like the exorcist where like there's a team of researchers looking for Mew, they or they find his DNA rather, and they're cloning him to make Mewtwo. There's a head scientist who does exchange a few brief words with Mewtwo in every cut about how they're trying to make the most powerful Pokemon ever. In the original Japanese version, he also has he's this entirely different motive where he has a dead daughter. He's managed to resurrect her consciousness. And he's trying to make a clone of her body that can survive so he can put her consciousness into it. And Mewtwo is kind of like the patient zero to see if that can be done. Weird. I wonder why Warner Brothers didn't want to include the dead daughter angle in the Poke in the G-rated Pokemon movie. I, I vaguely remember that this thing exists, right? Like, doesn't this whole thing end with all of Mewtwo's friends dying or something? Yeah, the first 20 minutes of the movie, a lot of it is devoted to a young Mewtwo kind of floating around in this liminal space with the consciousness of the scientist's dead daughter, 
And eventually that all culminates in none of the clones being able to sustain themselves except for Mewtwo. And Mewtwo has to watch as just like this little girl that he's been friends with and his other Pokemon friends just kind of fade out of existence. Wow. Yeah, I, I, had, I was like, I do not remember seeing this as a kid. And the reason why was because it was not in the version that I watched as a kid. The version we watched instead began with a terrible 15-minute short called Pikachu's Vacation, where Pikachu yep. is like wandering around a tropical island and it uses like really insane iMovie transitions. It's awful. I can't think of a more cynical move than looking at the original version of this movie and thinking, we got to cut out all this existential character development for Mewtwo. The kids are going to be wanting to see that little yellow guy. Can we like throw something in there where they're just like on vacation or something? Cynical for sure. But when something is like generating money at this level, I think it's it's hard to maintain an artist's spirit. I think you just get yeah. kind of money blind, you know? Let's talk about uh, this property. I have a very specific question that I'd like to ask you guys. Do you you remember a specific moment where you first became aware of Pokemon? I was kind of trying to think about that because like I said, this was the like franchise in my childhood where I felt like I was the one who found it, you know? Right. I remember seeing magazine ads for this thing. Okay. That like showcased a lot of the different Pokemon and thinking like those all look like cool creatures i want this thing it wasn't like one of those creepy 90s video game magazine ads where it's like a woman's naked ass with a pokeball <laughs> branded on it and then it's like pikachu's coming to fuck your game boy or whatever <laughs> they're I, I have no doubt they exist because that was very much the vibe of gaming advertisements in the 90s. Yeah. We kind of need to go back to that, don't we? I agree completely. <laughs> but, but like, uh, I think by this point, I might have already been a Nintendo Power reader. So it's entirely possible that I was lear that I learned about this thing from Nintendo Power. Ben Pitt, you're a little bit younger. How good was your memory forming faculties? Do you remember the first time you heard about or became aware of Pokemon? I have an older brother who's five years older than me, and he had a blue version and an original Game Boy. So I feel like maybe it was that. I know I had some early Pokemon cards in like a Pokemon collector's book too. Yeah, it's so weird because there, it was like it was there were several wings of the assault. You know, the invasion mm -hmm. came by land, by air, by sea, in in different forums. Yeah, multi pronged attack for sure. Because there was the game, there was the TV show, and then there was the trading card game, which was like a whole other thing. And they were all pretty much simultaneously launched. Yeah. I mean, like they Nintendo came out guns fucking blazing for American children. And I feel like they they got us, you know? Like, I can't think of anything before or since that had the impact on me that Pokemon had. I was hypnotized by this thing. It was all I could think about when it came out. Allow me to delight you with the first time I became aware of Pokemon. Okay. My father was driving me to elementary school, and he said, hey, I have to talk to you about something very serious. I just heard on the news that there is a cartoon in Japan, and it's giving kids seizures. Oh, wow. I remember this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Now, it hasn't started airing in America yet, but they said it's going to. And so I want you to know that you're not allowed to watch that show because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It is called Pointy Man. <laughs> <laughs> and then you saw Pokemon and you were like, oh, I'm all good. <laughs> that is literally the moment I became aware of the concept of, of Pokemon in a weird, circuitous way. I do remember in like first grade or maybe it was kindergarten. I can't remember. The teachers like sat us down and were like, you are not allowed to play Pokemon on the playground. Like, you are not allowed yep. to pretend to be Pokemon, to pretend to fight. You're not allowed to pretend to be? It wasn't just a fucking trading card <laughs> ban. They said, you can't pretend to be Pikachu on the playground? Yeah, I do distinctly remember this. Whoa, that is like thought crime shit, dude. That's 1984, motherfucker. I almost get it, though. I really can't imagine what it must have been like to be just like a totally normal, sane adult when Pokemon Mania was really fucking hitting the u.s because it was like something got put into the water like kids went fucking nuts for this no game boys at school that's one thing no trading cards at school that's one thing but like hey are you pretending to be a, a porygon stop it let's get into our tier list there's three of us uh this week and we thought hey let's just split the tier up into three right yeah and you had the bright idea of giving ben the honor of 
handling the both extreme ends of the scale. Ben, you're going to be giving us our F tier pick and our S tier pick. What a distinct honor. This was definitely at the the front of my mind while I was watching this last night. And uh, and and peek behind the curtain, I, I did watch this with my girlfriend. And we kept being like, oh, that's F tier. Oh, that's S tier throughout the entire movie. I hope you weren't expecting to F or S your girlfriend after you <laughs> watched the Pokemon with her. <laughs> uh, no comment. But I will. I do have the distinct honor of, of saying what the F tier for this movie is and uh what i ultimately landed on the thing i actually woke up this morning still kind of being annoyed about Mm. is the fact that mewtwo does erase everyone's memory so the whole movie didn't Mm. fucking matter that's so awful that's so annoying that does feel like a cop out what a tv show ass move to pull too right yeah yeah it's like well we don't want kids asking why they don't reference mewtwo when they watch the next episode of the anime so we'll just pretend like oh well um they forgot or whatever yeah classically cliched move in anime by this point and also just in television right yeah, you know like yeah, at the yeah. end of the episode of family matters urkel has to get hit on the head again and go back to normal or the show changes dylan i think you're doing our d tier this time i'm doing the d tier this week d for dylan if there was one element of pokemon the first movie that really truly threw me for a loop that baffled me as a viewer it was the song Brother My Brother by Blessed <laughs> Union of Souls. Oh my god. I want you to know that unprompted my girlfriend and I both started singing along to this song when it started playing. Well, let me let me make one thing clear. I, I don't believe that this song's place is in the D tier. I'm not this does not reflect my opinion on the quality of it as a uh, a cheesy corny piece of 90s pop uh, paraphernalia. It, it's rather for the way that it gets implemented in the movie. Uh, it, I'm talking about the filmmaking approach to using this song. Oh, no, I get it. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me set the scene for you guys. You are a Pokemon trainer. You're trapped on an island. Your entire team of Pokemon have been stolen and cloned against their will, against your will. Now, your Pokemon are being forced to fight against their clones, presumably to the death. You don't know what's going on, right? You're powerless to do anything but stand by and watch, and your Rapidash is now preparing to unleash a fire blast right into the face of its own genetic copy. It has no choice. It's kill or be killed. Cue the music. For the next two minutes of screen time, we watch while Pokemon just beat the fucking shit out of each other, just biting and scratching and headbutting. And we occasionally cut to their helpless trainers kind of wringing their hands on the sidelines about it. And it's all scored for some reason to this mid-tempo, we have Backstreet Boys at home ass fucking song. Bizarre. What a weird tone clash. What's going on here? I looked in New Blessed Union of Souls just very briefly. Something about the fact that they're from Cincinnati, Ohio, and winding up in this Japanese-ass movie really tickled me. Wait, Trevor, was this in the original Japanese cut, too? No, I was just going to say, would you be shocked to learn that this song is completely (laughs) absent from the Japanese version of this movie? Obviously, the Japanese animators and directors who were making this sequence would never intend to, like, completely completely obliterate all of the tension of it with like yeah a needle drop like this it really sucks all the energy out of that fight in the original japanese version that's like just soundtracked by like a particularly intense segment of the original score for this movie because of course it is because of yeah, course right, it obviously is. why w- why would it be anything but that right <laughs> for sure for that matter i don't think blessed union of souls wrote this song <laughs> intending it to be a fight song i mean no nope. the the culprit has to be that producer guy right Norm Norman Grossfield, he must have been yeah. in total executive. I'm blind with all the money. You know, I've got a song that might be a hit. This song is free. I got a movie that might be a hit. I cannot avoid the corrupting powers of all this money. As a viewer, there's nothing that turns me off quite as fast as feeling like a movie is having its quality compromised in order to boost its profit. You know, like the. I always think of that moment at the end of The Rise of Skywalker when Rey, like, for no reason at all, alone in the desert, turns her lightsaber on and then turns it back off so that you can see that it's yellow and Disney can sell you a lightsaber. Yeah. I'll agree with you 
on all of those points uh, about its relationship to the movie, but I will say that I did have this soundtrack on CD as a child and in my Sony Discman for several years in a row, and this was definitely my number one most played song when I was sort of between the ages of 8 and 10, so I just have pure nostalgia when the song comes on. Of course. But just like that embarrassed nostalgia where it's like, damn, I used to think this song was so hard. Let me clarify once again, I am not laying blame at the feet of Blessed Union of Souls, or for that matter, director Kunihoko Uyama. Please do not allow this to affect their artistic credit score, but still... Brother My Brother is in the D tier this week. Trevor, you got the C tier this week, and I'd love to hear what you came up with. I do. The C tier is always kind of an interesting pick because it's like something that just kind of works in a way, I think, but still isn't that great. I'm not really a person who enjoys like picking movies apart and identifying like narrative or logical inconsistencies or plot holes. Sure. But there was something about this movie that felt a little inconsistent to me and wound up being actually like a source of how I was able to enjoy like certain segments for sure. So for the C tier, I've picked uh, the movie's inconsistent ethics regarding Pokemon battles. Mm. Mm. Pokemon as a franchise is kind of built like on the foundation. Like the foundation of this franchise is that these are creatures that you're going to make fight each other. That's right. Right? Yeah. It happens in pretty much every episode of the anime series. It is what the games are entirely about. There's an inherent ethical tension to the very property itself. Yeah. That's kind of the only thing Ash lives for. Like, it's the only yeah. thing that gets him up out of bed in the morning is like, man, can't wait to make my best friend animals fight each other. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And an example of that, in, within the first few minutes of being introduced to Ash in this movie, he gets challenged to a Pokemon battle and nobody fucking bats an eye. It's a great day out, great activity for them to be having while they're on a picnic. When Mewtwo gets the idea that he wants to start making Pokemon fight. Everybody loses their minds. And there's all these lines that are like, Pokemon aren't meant to fight. Not like this. Why can't Mewtwo see that it's wrong to make Pokemon fight this way? There's a lot. There's like the, the little claws, the wormy little claws yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to tenuously draw a razor thin line between good and evil. Yeah, right. They're supposed to fight, but but like smile about it. Anyway, that was just something that really amused me while watching like the middle third of this movie. So I, I almost pulled a quote for this episode from a film critic who got right to the heart of it. I want to call him out now. Jeffrey Westhoff of the Northwest Herald from Crystal Lake, Illinois, all the way back in, uh, in 99, said, With its undertones of slavery and cockfighting, Pokemon <laughs> might have the most unsavory premise ever for children's entertainment. Yeah, and none of, none of the characters within this fictional universe even realize that until one of the Pokemon themselves is like, hey, yeah, let's throw it down. Let's do it. You want to live like you want to live that life? You're about that life. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. <laughs> Catch these hands. Yeah. C tier pick, the movie's inconsistent ethics regarding Pokemon battles. It amused me, even though it did feel like kind of like something that maybe they didn't put a ton of thought into when coming up with the plot of this movie. I will take the B tier as my final pick for this tier list. I'm gonna pick the scene where Mewtwo steals everybody's Pokemon. Okay, great sequence. I was kind of surprised how much this sequence kind of got me involved and made me feel the stakes, you know? Yeah. Like, the trainers, they they initially make a, a very futile attempt to uh, face off against Mewtwo. Everybody's very quickly vanquished. And then uh, Mewtwo has this immortal line of dialogue where he says, As the victor, I now claim my prize. Your Pokemon! And then, like, mm -hmm. he sends out this, like, real menacing-looking swarm of these fucked-up Pokeballs. Yeah. With the little eyes on them. I hated these things as a kid. These things freaked me out. These things and, and the robotic arms that kind of oh, grapple yeah. onto Ash, and he has to pry Pikachu away from as, like, he's going into the machine. This stuff, like, really kind of got to me as a kid. And it's kind of a well-directed sequence. You have, like, really fast cutting of the trainer getting their Pokemon stolen away from them. You know, they're trying to run. They're trying to hide. Yeah. Yeah, I have to imagine if you're a kid, it, it probably feels a little bit emotionally like when you're faced off with a schoolyard bully, you know, who's bigger than you, who's stronger than you, and he wants your fucking milk money, and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. That scene when uh, Ash launches himself off the stairs to grab the the one that Pikachu was just taken into, and then just, like, falls super far headfirst into that pool. It's like, 
damn. That was kind of my favorite action sequence in the movie, Ash chasing uh, the balls that were trying to get Pikachu. Yeah. To me, I think that half of the encounter is a little bit less involving. And I do think in general, the whole sequence is a little long, which is why uh, I put it here in the B tier. But I do think that's a cool concept and something the video game should do, right? Have your Pokemon get stolen from you in the middle of the story? That would be kind of sick. Oh, that would be pretty cool. That would be like getting back to Firelink Shrine and finding out that the bonfire's out. Yeah, totally. So anyway, that's my pitch for the B tier. I am putting the scene where Mewtwo stole everybody's Pokemon. Well, for my A tier pick, I kind of went back and forth on whether I should select this, but I am ultimately going to. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the first 20 minutes of the original Japanese cut of this movie here, just because... I was really surprised when I turned this thing on and was greeted to this almost like self-contained story at the beginning of it about like existentialism and what it means to truly be alive and to be human. It feels like a lot of very complex themes to be working into what is ostensibly a movie for children. And it was nice to see that like, even if that didn't make it into the version that made it across the seas to like, you know, the idiot Americans. It was nice to see that there was like some kind of intention put into it at the start there, at least. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. I'm almost tempted to go back and watch it, but will I? Hmm. That that leads me to the S tier. Yeah. And based on what my S tier is going to be, I think I am going to have to go back and watch this Japanese cut because my S tier is the first 20 minute prologue of the English cut where we see Mewtwo in the vat and blow up and we see that whole backstory. Basically everything from the start of the movie up until we get the uh, the title card because that was the part where I was really leaning forward and being like, holy shit, wait, is this movie going to like rip? And I don't think the whole movie ripped, but I was fascinated by that. It is interesting, right? Especially for something, the localization process that tried to sand off so many edges. It's interesting how long they're willing to go without Ash or Pikachu in this thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, I don't care about any of those characters for real. Once they show up, I'm like, oh, now it's this little, this thing for little kids. But like all the stuff where it's just like, oh, what's my purpose? Oh, your purpose is to fight for me. And he's like, nah, that ain't it, dad. And then he like flies off. I don't know, that whole sequence, everything about like the existentialist nature of who Mewtwo is, setting him up as this sort of sympathetic villain who is going to have this arc. I also think it like set up really well where it's like if your purpose is to fight because that's what Pokemon are for. They are like, they exist for humans to like battle. Then it's like, I think his whole plot kind of makes sense based on like who he was and who he had as a role model. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it sets up sort of his idea of like, nah, I guess I should probably just be in charge then since I'm the strongest. And then he actually like tries to execute on that. And literally like day one, it's like, oh, actually, I I guess I just uh, had an extremely limited worldview based on, (laughs) who my dad was. Yeah. That is interesting, isn't it? It's it's sort of like he was he was really doing the best with what he had and what he believed about the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've made it through the tier list. Now all we have to do is our formal review metric, which we borrow from the 1990 Game Pro magazine review section, broken down into categories, which we rate from a scale from one to five. That's right. We're going to start by talking about the graphics, how this movie looks. Uh, Ben, are you also going to be scoring this with us? Yes, I am. Uh, Why don't you go first, then? Cool. I gave the graphics a nice, solid 4.0. It's very nice, clean, hand-drawn animation. It's a huge jump up from what the actual, like, Saturday morning cartoon version looked like. Overall, just some really cool stuff. Definitely not groundbreaking, not more than a 4, but I enjoyed it 4. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I really didn't see anything to complain about when it came to how this movie looks. Like, being a theatrical release, it definitely had a higher budget than a lot of other anime made for kids. And I think while it can kind of, it can be easy to take this for granted in this day and age, I think a lot of the Pokemon are just generally kind of cool looking creatures that are fun to watch fight. Mewtwo in particularly has like a really great design about him, I think. And I also enjoyed a lot of the elements of his castle and some of his cloning equipment, like the Pokeballs and the arms that we were talking about earlier. Obviously, it's not like serving up anything really mind-blowing like some of the other weightier anime features of this era, like Ghost in the Shell or Akira, but I still think that this is a pretty good-looking movie, so I'll I'll also give it a four. God, I'm way off the page from you guys. I mean, maybe I need to to go back and watch the Saturday morning cartoon again, but to me, it read hard of let's spend $5 million cashing in on this thing. I I thought it looked straight out of the TV show, but maybe maybe my memory is clouded. It, It looked kind of blurry. Some of those like wide shots where the characters uh 
are like walking the distance are insanely low res. I mean, I can't imagine what it might have looked like projected onto a theater screen at the time. I again, I, I would echo you, Trevor. I think the the appeal of the visuals is just those Gen One Pokemon designs, pretty timeless stuff. I felt that it was a pretty ugly, very limited animation thing mm -hmm. for such a wide theatrical release. I gave it a one point five. You know, I do have kind of a real soft spot for anime of this era, so maybe that's influencing. Um, my scores and maybe Ben's as well. I could see definitely why this would hit lower on the scale for some people. Yeah, I, I'm willing to accept. I'm, you know, Ben, you have nostalgia goggles on for anything in and around this movie. I do think the TV show looked worse. I just, I feel like I yeah. distinctly remember. And it just makes sense to me that the TV show would look worse. Should we start talking about sound? Man, the audio elements of this viewing experience are really going to change based on whether you're watching the original Japanese or the English dub. Of course, like the voice actors are different. And I think even, like, to this day, the English voice cast for Pokemon is one of the more grating voice casts out there, mm -hmm. both in terms of, like, the voices they're doing and some of the material they have to work with. But the big difference here for me was, of course, like, the soundtrack. We already talked at length about the My Brother, My Brother thing. So, yeah, I weighed back and forth on which one I wanted to go with. In the end, I feel more strongly negative about the English than I do positively about the Japanese. And just really based on Brother My Brother and the English voice cast, I'm going to have to go down to a 1.5 on this one. Ben, what about you? Where are you, where are you falling with the sound? Ultimately, I, I, I've started thinking a lot about that uh, soundtrack that I had in my uh, Sony Discman. I think there were a couple of cool score flourishes here and there, uh, but I have to agree with you overall, like about the the voice cast. Uh, so for me, it was it was definitely more of a mixed bag. I gave it a a, a gentlemanly three. Okay, right down the middle. I will also weigh in on the voice cast as a negative, but before I do, let's not besmirch the name of Akui Otani. I think her Pikachu voice is like. It's iconic for a reason. Oh, real highlight. You know, you really buy that the, that that little critter is making all those adorable sounds. Beyond Brother My Brother, that the OST album, from a certain perspective, it is a titan of the 90s movie soundtrack album genre. You got Britney Spears, NSYNC, Christina Aguilera, 98 Degrees, Bewitched, Aaron Carter, Vitamin C, M2M. Like, Warner Brothers was was fucking going all out with the, with all the juggernauts. None of that stuff was, like, in the movie, though, was it? I know, because the reason you can't really let it give the movie that much goodwill is yeah. all that shit shows up in the form of a very bizarre, like, end credits medley where every song is played for like 30 seconds and then gets really choppily crossfaded into the next song. Yeah. Like you're watching a, a, a Time Life magazine, the hits of Pokemon infomercial or something. If it's 1999, buy the the disc for sure. But it, does it really make the sound of this movie that much better? I wouldn't say so. I'm going to give it a 2.0. That seems fair to me. Um, let's talk about... Uh What's next? Control? This is the metric that we use to rate um, how much this feels like we're playing a video game while we're watching the movie. I'm going to start. I think it feels like the TV show, which in my mind is, like we said, land, air, and sea. It was a multi-pronged attack, and yeah. that feels like a distinct Pokemon entity from the video games, you know? I agree, yeah. Part of the same cosmos, but in my brain, not like an adaptation of the video game so much as a, a separate wing of the Pokemon invasion. The other thing that doesn't help here for me is New Island, which is a shit. That's none of the fucking games. What's New Island? Yeah, why weren't they going to Cerulean Cave to find Mewtwo? Yeah, mm -hmm. give, give me to fucking Cerulean Cave. Take me to Cinnabar, whatever. Yeah. Another thing that I remember at the time being a big point of discussion was that they included one Pokemon from Gen 2 yeah. outside of Togepi who was already established. This was wild though. This was kind of, this was one of the reasons why you went to go see the movie as a kid because they had a new guy in it. Yeah, I remember that blowing my mind. And now, now going back, you're going to pick one Pokemon to tease the whole next gen on? You're going to pick fucking Don fan? <laughs> That's such a, I, what I, a weak choice to tease the whole Johto Pokedex. Why Don fan? You know, maybe I'm being stupid and any glimpse of the new Pokemon gen would have excited me to this degree as a kid but i remember seeing that dude and being like yo it's a little tiny elephant who rolls around the next pokemon game is gonna be fucking lit this dude looks awesome one other thing about the control factor here is that a move i remember them pulling a lot in the series 
was that Ash would always be calling out specific moves during the battles. You know, Squirtle, use water gun or whatever. Mm, yeah. And they never do it in this movie. No, they do it a couple times. When? When the final form of the start, the three starters are fighting their clones, um, they all call out, and they call out their, like, iconic big move. Like, Blastoise, use Hydro Pump. Okay, okay, you're right. Venusaur, use uh, Razor Leaf. And then Mewtwo calls back Vine Whip. Real cool moment. That's some nice representation, yeah. Okay, rescinded. I'll take that back. Uh, you know what? Just for that, I'll bump it up. I was going to give it a 1.5. I'm going to give it a 2.0. That thing that Ben mentioned, that is going to be the difference for me between a 1 and a 1.5. I'm going to give this a 1.5. Just because, as a kid, I even remember, it always bugged me by how little it felt like the Pokemon TV show and then this movie as an extension of that were doing to kind of replicate the Pokemon game experience. I just remember never really feeling particularly serviced by it as a gamer. So the Pokemon fights are vaguely reminiscent of a video game in as much as any fighting could be, I think. But still, I'm, I'm going to go 1.5 here. I mean, I think the best thing I can say is that I really, really wished I was playing Red version at certain parts of this movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't say that I, I fundamentally disagree. I think I'm going with Trevor's uh, 1.5 here. Let's talk about the fun factor of this movie. How fun is it to watch Pokemon the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back? Ben, why don't you start us off? I think if I take the context in which I watched it, which was the first time in maybe actually 20 years, you know, knowing I'm going to have a fun chat with my buddies the next day. I was watching it with my girlfriend. We had a couple beers. So I think that I had a 3.5 experience watching this movie. Pretty high. 3.5, you're talking about... Uh, a pretty good time you had. Yeah, pretty good time. What about you? What about you, Trevor? This is going to be a tough one for you, isn't it? Because you had two distinct experiences. It is. It almost turned the getting ready for this episode into more of like a homework exercise than watching a, a fun movie with all my poker pals. I'm going to go with a 2.5 on this one, I think, just because I have like a, a soft spot for... 90s anime and getting to see such a like you know hallmark of um, an event movie in that genre really was kind of fun to revisit for me but mm -hmm. just kind of in a vacuum i don't think sitting down and watching the pokemon movie would be very fun for me as a 33 year old in 2024 well i'll speak to that i i did not have a ton of fun with this movie yeah. uh let's look at, a, at three little gags okay i'm gonna give you kind of a, a good a weird and a, and a bad okay the first time they do that who's that Pokemon gag is funny. I yes, think. I, I did think that was a nice little shout out. I enjoyed that. But they, they do it a few too many times. Yeah, agreed. Although I like that they got one of them wrong. I also think that was really funny. I think if you were a fan of the of the show, that you'd have been rolling at that shit. I also think that it's very strange. The Minnesota Vikings joke is very yes! weird. Oh, my God. Yeah, super weird. Had completely forgotten about that. So they're on that boat, and then uh, he's like, uh, they're Vikings. And then Ash is like, I think most of them are from Minnesota. That's just like such a weird, like, so we got to have something in there for the parents such a little four kids wb like little cramming yeah it is mm -hmm. uh, to me the craziest one though is the last line of the movie you've got fucking meowth doing the weakest pun in the whole goddamn movie and you go to credits on it where he's like i want to write i want to those catamarans roll credits <laughs> crazy to me yeah. <laughs> that they leave on that not good yeah i mean 70 minutes though 2.0 i'm going to give it a 2.0 fun factor i didn't have an awful time i feel like this next category is very tied to our fun factor i'm talking of course about the challenge we don't rate this on a scale of one to five though we rate this from beginner to intermediate to advanced to expert i kind of wavered back and forth on this one but Ultimately, I'm going to go with intermediate, I think. There's definitely like a, a brain rotting element to this movie that is frequently found in a lot of children's entertainment that I think would make this a somewhat difficult watch for an adult, especially if you have no investment in Pokemon or nostalgia for the property. Like I imagine for parents who had to take their kids to go see this thing in theaters, the Pokemon phenomenon must have been like incomprehensible. That being said, it's a very short movie. The plot's super easy to follow. I, I don't think there's anything too difficult here so i'm, I'm gonna wind up going with uh, intermediate yeah i mean i agree with pretty much everything you said there i think you know throw pikachu's vacation on this fucker and now we're talking about 
maybe a low advance yeah. uh, if you're a, especially if you're a parent uh-huh. trying to sit through this shit. Mm-hmm. Um, I still was not especially engaged, so I'm also landing in the kind of firmly, solidly, right in the middle of the intermediate tier mm-hmm. for the challenge. What about you, Ben? This was the one, the easiest one to come up with. Firmly intermediate. Full sweep agreement. Absolutely cannot imagine trying to watch this movie if you don't have not just like passing familiarity, but like intense knowledge and nostalgia around the Pokemon franchise. Like even if you had only ever played the games, then you would probably find this movie insufferable. Like let alone like forget like if you were a card game player, like absolutely not. (laughs) The people, (laughs) the card game collectors who were going to see this movie just so that they could get the exclusive cards. I mean, they got them. They fucking got them. Yeah. They might not even have stayed, honestly. Like, just like, nah, I'm not watching that stupid kitty bullshit. But it's like... Oh, man, pull a Wing Commander. Yeah. Go, for, yeah. go to see the, the Phantom Menace trailer or go to get your card and then leave. Exactly. Uh, there you go. We've rated it. And I played it. Yes, we have come to the segment of the show where, Dylan, you kind of in advance of the episode picked up the original Game Boy game and spent at least a little bit of time with it. That's right. I played Pokemon Blue... I named my trainer Dylan, and I named my rival Trevor. Hell yeah. Nice. For my starter, I picked Squirtle, not because it's easy mode, but because I wanted it to represent one of the freaky little guys we've gotten to know on this show, and I named it Toad. Great. He reminds me of him a little bit, right? Round head, silly mouth. Brock's gym obviously was a cinch, uh, swept everybody with water gun. But on my way there, I did encounter the elusive Viridian Forest Pikachu. And you know who that reminded me of? Exactly who I named him after I caught him. Blanca, the electric type user. Cool. <laughs> sure. God, imagine imagine a like live action Pokemon movie where they have to do Pikachu, but really the only way they're able to do it is like the same way they do Blanca <laughs> in the Street Fighter movie. <laughs> <laughs> I made sure to let Blanca lead my party at Mount Moon to get him some levels, and then he did pretty good in Cerulean City uh, against uh, Misty's team. And I got my tickets to get on the SSN, but then check it out on Route 5. I saw another Pokemon, Meowth, and I thought, you know who that looks like? The fucking Kill Rothy yeah. from <laughs> Wing Commander. So I caught him Meowth. I named him Kill Rothy. And uh, then we disembarked in Vermilion City. We went off against Lieutenant Surge for the Thunder Badge. Now, you might be thinking, a electric type, a water type, and a normal, what am I going to do against Lieutenant Surge? But then I realized that Toad can learn dig a ground type move Mm. it was going to be a close call because one thunderbolt from lieutenant surge's raichu would one hit ko my my toad but i gave him a a speed thing what are they called i don't remember x speed or something x speed yeah i gave him an x speed and he managed to get off uh his dig and i dodged both of those fucking thunderbolts i got the thunder badge and then i looked up and i realized holy shit it's three o'clock in the morning and i've been playing pokemon blue for two and a half hours i need to go to bed hell yeah uh game holds up very impressed i'm very impressed with how engrossed i was i'm excited to share that i also have been playing pokemon red version okay not just a red version but my original red version from when i was a child damn you're lucky the battery still works i know it has lived inside of a game boy advanced sp for the last decade plus shit um as a dedicated red version machine it is starting to go a little bit i have discovered that if the console gets jostled around or shakes too much, uh, the game just restarts. Uh, so I am spam saving. What do you think? Are you going to see it through or is it a little bit too shaky with the old hardware? Uh, I don't know. I kind of keep thinking about how much I want to go back to it. I was playing right before we hopped on. I am uh, mm. I didn't get as far as you. I was, uh, I'm wandering around Mount Moon right now. Even I gotta imagine if the inter- even if the internal battery ever dies on this thing, I'm I'm never getting rid of it. It's it's this is just an heirloom now. Well, that's Pokemon the video game as it exists. But now we've come to everybody's favorite segment of the show, mine and yours, and mine. Yeah, what kind of video game would this have been adapted to if it wasn't already a video game before it got adapted into a movie? This could conceivably have happened in my opinion because i mean just imagine if the tv show had gotten big the card game had gotten big and then they were like we should make a video game oh yeah i i'm i unfortunately can't be at my most creative during this installment of this particular segment just because i feel like i need to speak to 
my perception of what Pokemon was going to be when I was first starting to see promo for it as a little kid and starting to think, wow, I want to play this game. Okay, this is a different angle, but I am interested in what this could be. Yeah, same. I remember getting it as an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old or whatever I was back in the day. I think I was eight years old. I hadn't played too many video games. I, had, of course, played the big ones, but I wasn't familiar with every genre of video game. Mm. And something that I hadn't really come up against by this point was like the top-down turn-based RPG. Sure. So like, I got Pokemon Red version. I was so stoked to play it. And I remember feeling just the tiniest bit underwhelmed when I popped it in, fired it up, and discovered that the core gameplay mechanic was basically like navigating menus and picking (laughs) options. Yep, taking turns. I don't know what I was expecting it to be, really. I think maybe some kind of side-scrolling platformer where you played as different Pokemon, depending on what you had to do. Mm. But I, I think what I would expect this game to be like if I were watching this movie, I think I'd probably go with it being like a, a classic 2D fighter game, sure. like your Street Fighters and your Mortal Kombats. Yeah, I had a similar thought while I was watching watching it. I know such a game has been made. Yeah, Puck and Tournament, the Tekken thing. So I think we would have gotten one of those much, much earlier in the timeline if mm-hmm. Pokemon, the turn-based RPG, didn't exist. I think that's a format that always would have made sense to plug this one into. The clone angle fits nicely. Yeah, I was just going to say, the, the mechanic in this that really made was like a light bulb moment for me is that you're not necessarily necessarily playing as the pokemon you're playing as a trainer and then you get kind of like a almost like a marvel versus capcom element where you have like you pick your three pokemon at the start of every battle yep. and you can sort of sub them out and you've got totally. to build your little team of like okay well who are my three guys that i want to use throughout this fight mm-hmm. you're reading my mind ben and then the the clones obviously not all the clones had different animation because come on we got to keep this budget down yeah but some of the clones had like different stripings and different patterns and stuff and i gotta imagine you would have just continued that through and those would have been the beast yeah, skins. yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like a lore you do your mirror match but you got kind of a lore angle to do it with yeah mm-hmm. i can only imagine too that um you know if that game had come out in 1998 It would have been just as steep of like barrier to entry as other fighting games like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. And I just would have never gotten into Pokemon. And I can only imagine my life would have been entirely different. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're a Pikachu. You want to do Thunderbolt? Okay, so that's going to be quarter circle forward. Then you got to hold back for three seconds and press high and low punch at the same time. It would have been a nightmare. It would have been a nightmare. I would have never gotten into it. I would have I would have stuck to the card game and the anime. Well, I guess that leaves us boys with really nothing left to do. Uh, but to wind down the program here at the end of our journey, actually, Dylan, if I can, if I can just jump in real quick, uh, Trevor, Trevor, I do have something that uh, I want to talk to you about real quick uh, on air. Um, so, so in all the years we've known each other, I've never, I've never confessed this to you, but uh, actually, in secret, this entire time, I have been, oh boy, a uh, Pokemon professor. Really? I thought I thought you were just about to tell me that you had recently acquired like an eight foot. Statue of Mewtwo that was now living in your apartment. <laughs> <laughs> nope, uh, not this time. Okay. I can't go forward with you into this next adventure, but I, I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of tall grass in the uh, in the future as you as you march forward into future episodes. So um, I wanted to give you something to, to sort of keep you safe. Now, unfortunately, all of my annoying grandchildren have taken all my most of my uh, starter Pokemon, but but I do have have one left. So I, I wanted to give this to you. Okay, I can't wait to see what this is. Oh man, look at that! He's handing you a little red and white Pokeball, Trevor. I'm I'm cradling it in my hands gently, and I'm pressing the little button. And oh my gosh, what is coming out of here? Oh, wow. Look at that. I mean, it's kind of familiar looking. It's got that little round yellow body and a lightning bolt shaped tail, but then the face is, well, also familiar, but in a slightly more unsettling way. It's got kind of a, kind of a humanoid face. I, my Pokedex is not currently picking up any reading. It says that it's an unknown species. There is one quick way to figure out the name of a Pokemon, Trevor. Why don't you go ahead and ask the Pokemon what its name is? I What kind of bit are you guys doing here? Hey, little Pokemon, uh, why don't you tell me your name? Ben Pikachu. <laughs> Say that again, little guy? Ben Pikachu. Ben Pikachu. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, 
Talk about a long walk. A long walk is what we'll be taking, and I'm, you should be very grateful that you have this companion for you. Do you know what we're going to be watching next week, Trevor? I have certain fears about what we're going to be watching based on, you know, just kind of half-remembered timelines of when Pokemon movies were released in the United States. I hope you have enough shelf-stable food and potable drinking water stocked up because the year is about to change from 1999 to 2000, and I hear... All of the computers are going to explode or something. Yeah, they're all going to (laughs) crash. And now, just like Ash on New Island or perhaps poor Charizard in his little Pokeball, or Ben Pitkachu for that matter. Ben Pitkachu. You're trapped like a fucking rat. And in our next episode, you will be forced to watch Pokemon the Movie 2000. So you want to be a master of Pokemon? Do you have the skills to be number one? Yeah, it's interesting that they, they, they went straight from the first Pokemon movie to the 2000th one. But hey, at least we don't have to watch the uh, 1,998 that came in between, right? At least you'll be forging an incredible bond with a, with your new companion on this journey. Ben Pitkachu. <laughs> ben Pitkachu. <laughs> ben Pitkachu. He's adorable in a slightly unsettling way, don't you think? Yeah, um, I'm going to put him back in his Pokeball now just because I... <laughs> Looking at his face is doing something to my stomach. But Ben, I'm really glad you were able to make it onto the show. Trevor, Dylan, thank you so much for having me on this show. I've had an absolute blast talking Pokemon with you guys. It was some good Pokemania with some good Poke Bros. But for box office babombs, I've been Dylan Flynn. I've been Trevor Ickrath. And I've been Ben Pitt. And how about you, little guy in your Pokeball? Ben Pitt got you. <laughs> As saying, until next time, so long, gay Bowser. <laughs> This has been a production of The Lighthouse Keepers Company. Culture Illuminated.